Alito, good morning. Uh, my name is Andrew Jolivet. Uh, I come from the Opelousa and Atakapa, uh, people of Southwest Louisiana. Um, and I want to thank you for the invitation to be with you here today. Uh, and I would like to also recognize the Tongva people whose land that we stand on here um, for allowing us to be here uh, in their territory. I guess before I start, I wanted to um, say why, uh, why this study, why this title, Indian Blood, uh, Critical Interventions in um, Mixed Race Identity and HIV. One of the major issues in Native communities, particularly around uh, issues of uh, HIV and other public health disparities, uh, including mental health disparities, is actually the invisibility of Native people. One of the questions I ask students in my classes when they first show up on the first day is, how many of you see African Americans on campus or in the city of San Francisco? And pretty much all of them raise their hand. How many of you see Latinos? Uh, they raise their hands, Asian Americans, et cetera. When I ask them about American Indians, maybe one or two people raise their hand. And I think that there is an expectation uh, for Native people that they exist as uh, they did uh, four or 500 years ago. Uh, there is a lack of understanding of the degree to which Native people are actually racially mixed. Uh, they have the highest rate of interracial marriage of any ethnic group in the United States. People also misunderstand American Indian people's legal status, not um, to be categorized as simply people of color, but as separate uh, legal um, uh, groups, right, nations, sovereign nations. Uh, and so the politics of identity um, caused many issues, and so that's why um, this study uh, emerged in San Francisco to look at how does mixed race actually play into rates of HIV infection. Uh, and I started uh, this project uh, as a collaboration, I'm gonna skip through some of these things, but with the uh, Indigenous Wellness Research Institute at the University of Washington in Seattle, uh, where they run a program, the iHeart program, the Indigenous HIV AIDS Research Training Program. And as I was saying, um, let me just skip here. Why Indian blood? It really is this play on, um, in Native communities, when people say, oh, do you have Indian blood? <laughs> and people's, uh, so it's a play on race itself and racial mixing. Do you have Indian blood in you? But also, uh, metaphorical sort of in that sense, but also literal in the uh, mixing of blood in terms of intimate contact uh, between groups. Um, so these are some of the reasons, but why did I, I, I should back up a little bit and say for myself, um, in 2002, I was working at a middle school and getting ready to trans transition uh, into my position at San Francisco State University, and I was approached by one of the grandparents who worked at San Francisco State about a people of color and AIDS class that no one had taught for many years at San Francisco State. Uh, and so I decided to teach that class but part of the reason I had the interest in it, I don't come from a public health background. I'm a sociologist focusing on racial formation issues. Um, but in 2002, when I became ill myself um, and was hospitalized with pneumonia uh, and uh, diagnosed with AIDS actually at that time, I, I didn't know what was going on and had no idea. I thought I had walking pneumonia. Uh, and when I entered the hospital and found out uh, I had 35 T cells, my viral load was 500,000 copies per milliliter of blood. Um, and so I was very sick at that time. Uh, I had lost 25, 30 pounds. And what I realized and what I share with people when I um, do talks like this, um, and just wanted to give you a little bit of that context before I get into the m sort of meat of the presentation, is that I was focused so much on issues of racial and ethnic uh, inequality that I wasn't looking at the other aspects uh, or issues that impact us. And I think when we look at health, you have to look at it from a holistic approach. Uh, and so not paying attention even in my own life um, to issues, the intersecting aspects of my identity as a gay man of color um, was really important to me. And so I wanted to actually do something to um, address these issues. Um, So the organization, so I, I set out, you know, I ended up teaching this people of color and AIDS class, uh, and a colleague of mine, Rafael Diaz, who wrote a book on uh, Latino gay men and HIV, um, he came into my class and he did this presentation. It was based on a study done by Linda Valeroy and a, a group of researchers uh, in 2000. And what they found, it was a study of young men who have sex with men 15 to 22. It was a national study. And uh, they found that basically after African-American uh, men, actually mixed race men, had the highest rates 
of HIV infection. Uh, and there was no explanation of why. And so Raphael said, Andrew, you'd look at mixed race issues, you should study this. Uh, and so ever since then, I've been kind of looking at this issue um, through funding um, from the iHeart program at the University of Washington. Uh, I began to work with an organization in San Francisco, the Native American AIDS Project. Um, and what I basically we did is a study of uh, focus groups. There are 50 participants um, and uh, we did focus groups really kind of looking at not just HIV per se, but what are the stories of their lives um, and what was the impact. And so we're looking, I wanted to focus particularly on mixed race American Indian men and then listening to the community is so important as I heard some of the comments before this presentation started, really listening to the voices and needs of the community and not telling them what they need, but letting them tell you. Um, so I wasn't initially looking to study um, uh, transgender um, uh, people as well, and that's what the community told me, and so I also um, worked with uh, transgender folks in this study too. And so the selection criteria for this study um, basically was folks who self-identified uh, as uh, men who have sex with men, uh, men who self-identified as gay, who had biological parents who were mixed race, um, and then the age range was basically 20 to 65 years of age. One of the things, the key things that I found, and I think I'm gonna, um, just to give you a demographic snapshot uh, of the participants. Um, so the average age was 42, which I thought was actually good for this population because um, a lot of, uh, it's really difficult to get younger folks involved in the study, so we had a good range of people um, who participated. 28% uh, of the uh, folks in the study were um, positive. This was all by self-identification. It wasn't confirmed by testing. 72% um, were negative, 60% uh, identified as male, 14 is transgender, 14% is two-spirit. I'm not sure, how many people have ever heard the term two-spirit? Uh, and I think sometimes there's this misunderstanding of what two-spirit actually means, and a lot of people appropriate that term, particularly pe also people who are not native. Um, the term emerges out of the 1990s, actually. Uh, we, I just came from uh, an event, uh, what, just last week, celebrating the 40th anniversary of Gay American Indians, the first, um, gay or LGBT native organization in the country. They had their 40th anniversary last week and they really fought with anthropologists and researchers who were calling them Burdash, uh, hermaphrodites. Uh, and so this shift to two-spirit was trying to honor old, a traditional ways in which not every tribe though had two spirits, right? Or they had their own terms for themselves in their own language, things like Winkte or Nadlie. These terms, um, there are efforts to try to return to that tradition, and that's what I found in this study, actually, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but so 14% actually identified as two-spirit, having that balance of male and female energy, uh, and 2% as intersexed. Uh, let's see, in terms of uh, sexual orientation, folks identified 64% uh, as uh, gay or queer, uh, bisexual was 18%, two-spirit 18%. Uh, and it was what I found was interesting was the breakdown then of who was HIV positive in those different categories. 36% uh, of the gay and queer participants were positive. 64% uh, had experienced sexual violence. One of the huge issues that we see in our communities and it's often underdocumented, often underreported. Uh, we're hearing a lot in the media, right, about Black Lives Matter and that, and that movement. Uh, but very little also about what's happening in native communities particularly rates of violence against trans uh, native folks and women in American Indian uh, communities, both in urban areas and uh, reservations and border towns, where, for example, American Indian women are three times more likely to be the victims of uh, sexual assault than any other ethnic group, and that's perpetrated by non-natives. Uh, and then 63% of the gay uh, and queer identified participants who are HIV positive also experience the sexual violence. Overall, 56% of the participants uh, experienced sexual violence, but what we see is that there's this, there was a, I saw this huge gap between rates of HIV infection based on whether or not the person had, had experienced sexual violence. Uh, and then overall, 69% of the participants who were HIV positive had also experienced uh, sexual violence. Uh, in terms of bisexual participants, 11% were HIV positive, 44% um, had experienced sexual violence. And then 100% uh, who identified uh, as um, bisexual uh, and experienced sexual violence were also HIV positive. Um, and then these are, are the last two figures are the same for the overall uh, participants. 
For Two Spirits, what was interesting to me was the rates of sexual violence were so high, 77% more than all the other groups. And for me, and you'll see this in some of the quotes that I'll share later from the study participants, is I think that's because so many people don't understand Two Spirit and what it means, and that there's been, because of colonization, there's been so much backlash um, on reservations uh, where people, uh, where communities have taken on the ideas of outsiders. This has also happened in terms of race relations. Um, and so <clears throat> there's really been a breakdown of support systems that traditionally maybe existed in native communities, both in urban areas and on reservations, uh, because of homophobia. Uh, transgender participants, 14% uh, were HIV positive, 28% um, uh, experienced uh, sexual violence, right? I'm gonna skip this, you can just kind of take a look at it, but it was an even breakdown in terms of what type of work that people did. Um, they came from all kind of different backgrounds. Um, and many people though were, were also um, unemployed or retired or marginally housed, uh, about 34%. The cities represented, I mean, it was pretty wide because I also um, recruited folks um, somewhat nationally who were coming into town for a two-spirit powwow. It's the only two-spirit powwow which exists in the country. They just had the fourth annual two-spirit powwow uh, last Saturday. And the tribal affiliations represented the largest tribes. Uh, it's not surprising the three largest, uh, or at least the two largest tribes in the, in the, in the country, the Diné or Navajo and the Cherokee, uh, and then the Apache, those three re uh, respectively each represented 10% of the total population in the study. The Lakota are also a large tribe. They represented about 6% of the study. So yeah, as I said, 50 participants uh, were recruited via the Native American AIDS Project. Random snowball sampling was used. Um, they were also uh, given uh, demographic profile surveys to complete. The size of the focus groups ranged between like five and 13. Um, they were all held at the Native American AIDS Project in San Francisco. One thing I would note though before the next slide is what's interesting too is funding. I was hearing you all also talking a lot about funding and it's interesting that there's so much competition uh, for funding, particularly when we're talking about ethnic specific healthcare issues. This was actually one of the other issues I was originally interested in. This study actually was going to originally include more organizations because I wanted to look not just at native mixed race populations, but as I tried to seek funding for it, people said, this is really complicated. Even just looking at mixed race by itself is so complicated. So I was trying to work with a group, the Black Coalition on AIDS, the Native American AIDS Project, uh, our API Wellness Center, and a program called Hermanos uh, de Luna y Sol. And uh, it just got so complicated. So I decided because my expertise is in Native American studies, I am native, and that the natives also have the highest rates of interracial marriage um, and mixed race people that it would make sense to start here as a model to look at how mixed race might impact other communities as well. Um, and what's interesting here is I'm one, if I asked in the group here, one of the questions was, have they ever experienced the change in their racial identification um, over time? Like how many people in the room would say, oh, I changed my racial identification at some point in my life? That what does that do to someone's sense of self if they're constantly changing or being told who they are when it doesn't match um, how they self-identify? And so that's why people change that identification over time. As you can see, 24% of the participants um, had changed their racial identification, 28% um, had changed their gender, gender identification over time. Some of the factors that I was trying to understand, right, some of the questions on the survey were about gender um, and racial discrimination, but also, um, uh, so what we found um, was pretty high rates, and I think there's always a little bit of underreporting um, with this, but 52% of participants experienced racial discrimination during a six-month period, and then there was a rise uh, to 58% uh, uh, over a 12-month period. Uh, in terms of gender, 36% had experienced gender discrimination over a six-month period, 40% um, over a 12-month period. The other factor, as you all know, mostly when we're looking at um, risk factors, um, drug or alcohol use, 56% uh, um, had engaged in sex under the influence of drugs. Um, I was interested in their, uh, whether or not they dated interracially, and I think because they are mixed race people uh, in the study, 84% uh, said yes. 56% um, had experienced sexual violence, and then also knowledge. I wanted to know how much did folks feel like they were knowledgeable about um, HIV, and so 78% felt that they were knowledgeable. 
Um, here, uh, we found that uh, unprotected sex over a six-month period was a, uh, about 34%, again, um, perhaps a little bit of underreporting. We do see uh, a rise, though, of that at 46% over 12 months. And then in terms of um, sex under the influence of drugs over six months, 28% said they had engaged in sex, right, under the influence of drugs, 28% over a 12-month period. What's interesting, though, is probably many of you know that alcohol um, rates uh, in Native communities are quite high. And so what we saw when we asked the same question for alcohol, the rates were higher. So 34% uh, had engaged in sex under the influence of alcohol and 44% uh, over a 12-month period. I know this one's a little hard to read. <laughs> um, so what I will point out here is I wanted to also understand coping mechanism strategy for strategies that the groups had for dealing with stress. Um, so two of the things that I, I was that I'll say are most interesting here is folks who actually had knowingly engaged in sex with someone who was positive. I think it's it was a, a high number is 52 percent, uh, and I think that that's because of all the advances people were talking about prep and other um, things that are out there. Um, and so people's knowledge of HIV and how it functions, I think that that's why that number was pretty high. But I also found that 86% actually did feel that they had ways of dealing with the discrimination that they faced. Um, and 82% uh, had ways of dealing with stress. But all of those ways weren't positive necessarily or helpful, right? Sometimes that was drug or alcohol use, uh, and they pointed that out. But a lot of them did feel like they had ways of managing those issues. But what I came to find after talking to the groups um, and, and listening to them, this model I developed, basically what the takeaway I guess I would share today to consider for native populations in this county potentially, issues are always different based on communities. Um, but I do think that issue of invisibility and underreporting of HIV AIDS cases, people saying they're uh, marked as either white or Latino uh, or Asian perhaps instead of native. Uh, is also undercounting the amount of uh, Native people who are infected with HIV and AIDS. Um, and so what I found was there were six patterns that came, emerged from this study um, that increased risk for Native populations. Um, and these six factors included what I call two-spirit cultural dissolution, historical and intergenerational trauma, gender and racial discrimination, mixed race cognitive dissonance, sexual violence, and then what I called stress coping in an urban Indian kinship network. How do they deal with, how do natives deal with stress in urban environments? Where do they get their support from? Just like kinship networks were so important within a uh, tribal context, how are those redeveloped or not redeveloped in urban areas? Where do people go for support? Are there native agencies like Red Circle uh, Project here or uh, in Los Angeles um, out of uh, APLA uh, would be one example of an ethnic specific place where support could be found. So the model, the way I see it working is that, as I mentioned, two-spirit cultural dissolution, what happens is after contact colonization, those support networks that once existed um, that actually saw two-spirit people as leaders, often spiritual leaders in the community, um, that there was a breakdown in that support within the communities. And so as that two-spirit cultural ethic of support starts to dissolve, we see um, the issue become compounded by other factors. And so that followed with uh, historical and intergenerational trauma, right? Um, issues like um, being in boarding schools or the parents being in boarding schools, how that trauma gets passed from one generation to the next becomes very significant. Uh, one thing that uh, Native American psychologist um, uh, Eduardo and Bonnie Duran identified is this thing called the soul wound. And when we talk about soul wound or soul loss, it's this idea that we lose a part of ourselves after many generations of traumatic experiences, right? That something about us um, is lost. Uh, and so <clears throat> after that, we see that, you know, from the slides you just saw, that there a lot of folks are experiencing then racial and gender discrimination, what's compounding the other issues. And then this mixed race cognitive dissonance, this lack of being able to um, identify yourself and having others identify you is, is, is presents a lot of challenges for uh, folks in the community and then that being compounded by the rates of sexual violence. Um, the only thing that I feel like that really can actually address some of these issues is uh, culturally responsive and culturally specific support um, networks and programs and mentoring programs, cross-generational mentoring programs, which I'll talk about at the end in terms of the recommendations. 
So I'm going to skip this just to give you a sense, and I'll read it. I know it's long. I put these full things, but they're very rich quotes that kind of speak to each of the six factors. Um, this first one was spoke to this issue of two-spirit cultural dissolution. You know, I've been to places where I've met people like myself on the reservation who also attended boarding schools, but obviously didn't like themselves enough because they didn't want nothing to do for uh, didn't want nothing to do for themselves. But um, I got beat up. I got the shit beat out of me so bad you wouldn't even recognize me. It was so bad. I got kicked in the face about 25 times by this guy with boots on, just totally beat up on the reservation. Nobody came to help me. Nobody helped me. After leaving, I got into a relationship, but then I started using again. So it was like, you know what? You're gonna go back to the reservation and end up going back downhill. Sobriety. That's why I came here, they mean to the Native American AIDS Project. I needed to get the sobriety. And that was the main thing, because what was up there for me on the reservation was no longer working. You know, there was like a mile of death up there, really serious death up there. So to me, like when death is always open, all those old people are definitely gone. Those people are definitely gone. What I take, took away from this quote was that when they say all the old people are gone, they mean the traditions, the people who would have actually known the role and place of two-spirit people who would not have allowed uh, them to be victimized in this way, to be assaulted right within their own communities. And then for historical and intergenerational trauma, I think you know how PTSD, for example, is passed from one generation to the next is what we mean. What I mean by historical trauma, I also call it um, spirit traumas or PTIS, uh, post-traumatic invasion syndrome. Right, the effects of um, uh, having every form of your, your life changed and how that gets passed from generation to generation. This quote um, uh, kind of speaks to it. I had asked one person um, what, what it, how HIV had impacted them or what were their thoughts, and they said, it scared me. It's taken people I've known. I try to be careful. Sometimes you re suspend responsible thought and action, though. And I think that's how historical trauma can impact people, right, is that you want to numb the pain that you've experienced throughout your life. So this quote speaks to it. I grew up by myself, and I'm a lot of ducking and dodging, you know, a lot of it. It was just a constant, a constant life, you know. So um, my family didn't know how to deal with it because my mother was working all of the time. She didn't know what was going on. And I don't know, I was drunk a lot too. You know, I started smoking cigarettes. I learned how to inhale when I was about five or six years old, and I liked it. I was smoking, and my sister would let me smoke. By the time I was 13, my mother allowed me to smoke cigarettes. She allowed me to smoke weed. She allowed me to do speed. She let me do whatever I wanted as long as I did what I was supposed to do, you know? And so here, I think it's, it's this issue of it's not a judgment of the parent. It's the sense of what's happened, what historical trauma um, has happened in the family's life that this kind of thing happens and continues and is perpetuated, and how do we break that cycle? And that's why the stress coping mechanisms were so important, right, is to how do we actually deal with that pain um, that exists in our communities. In terms of gender and racial discrimination, um, this um, quote here, I think, speaks to some of the issues that are at play in Native communities. I'm short, I'm fat, and I'm red, and I ain't upset about it. When it comes to dominant culture, I've never related. I mean never. I always look at values. Well, on the contrary, I kind of take an opposing point of view. Is that what they call it? Identity to me is, well, still kind of problematic because of the, quote, gay, queer culture. I was never, quote, out, but I was labeled as being out. So I was the person that other people came to, both male and female. Historically, I've always, always been at more comfort with um, female identity, whether it's biological, mostly biological female, but it's just that femaleness. If I've got a choice, if I'm going to kick it with the boys, hetero or gay or queer, or if I'm going to kick it with the dykes, I'm going with the dykes. Because I can relate. I understand those dynamics. So this person here, I think what they're saying is that, they, they, that the sort of gay ink culture, if you will, right, um, that produces this sort of uh, way in which you're supposed to perform gayness or queerness didn't fit for them. It didn't work. And so for them, they actually don't, they tie that, tied it to gender. Right, and also to race. And so where do you find your comfort? You find it in, 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 in not necessarily in, in sex, right, uh, per se, but in relationships. It's about building relationships. Um, and so this, this quote, I think, really sp speaks to that. 
uh, in terms of the mixed race cognitive dissonance, right, this, this idea of power, how can you belong to multiple groups? And so if you are of multi, uh, multiple ethnicities or racial backgrounds, can you actually still belong, right, to all those groups? If you're not accepted, how does that impact you? If you are constantly feeling like, say you are uh, Choctaw and uh, Mexicano, and the Mexicanos are telling you you're never Mexican enough, and the Choctaws are saying you're never Choctaw enough, or you look more like you're this group and you don't belong. How do you deal with that? How do you address that? How do you resolve that inherent conflict within yourself? This quote spoke to it. Like, you know, racially, I'm like a quarter white, but I don't feel white, and I don't look white. So um, people often can't tell, because I'm so mixed about what I actually am. So like Latinos will think I'm Latino, Filipinos will think I'm Filipino, you know, some Asians will think I might be part Asian or something, and Indian people often think I'm Indian or Mexican or something. I'm just racially unidentifiable often. Um, I think that growing up, I felt a difference between the way like white people feel about themselves and their privileges. Like I think they feel more entitled often to things. And I've actually seen that a bit in my family because I know like the side of my family that's like Latino and Asian, they come from a colonial place. And also like my dad on the Cherokee side, he was racist too. He did not like black people. And I'm not sure if it was the part of him being white or part of the Indian side. And yes, I know knowing the community and what it's like uh, in Oklahoma, it was probably both. But yeah, so I'm not only experienced, I've not only experienced racism, I've uh, felt discriminated against um, just in seeing things in my own family. So often weird things that mixed race just play out in your own immediate family. And some of the people also talked about the fact that they come from like these mixed families. It may have been the same participant who was talking about um, his mom is white and his dad's Indian. His dad would always come home, you know, talking about white people. And so how do you deal with that when you're coming home, even in your own family, hearing people talking about a part of yourself and balancing that, um, that self-hatred? And then sexual violence. Um, how this, this issue leads to um, the soul loss that I was talking about and a debilitation of community networks of support, uh, which in turn causes this dissolution of two-spirit um, ethics of a mutual respect and reciprocity, which leads to this increased sexual violence. At the age of eight, I started or I was being raped. I was raped from the age of eight until I was 18. Right or wrong, I actually did the one thing that they tell you not to do, and I actually resisted. So I experienced some extreme violence. I suppose I'm kind of a case study. I was just eight when this all started. So the behavior that I took on and displayed during that time was atypical. I tried to resist, but yet it's in the American paradigm. Let's blame the victim. And I was just a bad student. It's like, no, I was just doing the best that I could, you know? I was just doing the best that I knew how, given the circumstances. Later, I got into BDSM, bondage, domination, sadomasochism world. Hmm, I wonder why, BDSM, pain, baby, pain. What I took away from this was that the person was saying, you know, there are many ways in which we respond to sexual violence in our, in our lives. Um, we can um, retreat, right, from co intimate contact with other people. We can engage in more of that contact. We can, it, it affects us psychologically, right? It causes more trauma and how we deal with that trauma is really important. Um, and so the final um, thing here, which I, as I said, that I feel like these um, urban Indian kinship networks, right? How can they reproduce traditional values um, and networks of support, peer support for all of these issues that native people are dealing with? Uh, and so this quote here, I think from one of the participants actually speaks to what I'm talking about. When you have organizations like Red Circle Project or the Native American AIDS Project, this is what people can get from that. It felt like, it almost felt like, just because we're Indian and we don't hang out or things like that, but I mean, I always wanted to be friends with Indians, but they always seemed kind of like I was, I felt like not really Indian because I was raised by white people. So it was kind of, I was always shy and I didn't identify with Indian issues. But when it came to, uh, when I came to NAP, Native American AIDS Project, um, that was when I was able to find out about Bates, Bay Area, Amer Bay Area American Indian Two Spirits and all these wonderful organizations that have to do with American Indian people. So I learned how to bead and like all these wonderful things that I'd been wanting to experience. All these wonderful things for many years and I never knew that I could because I just never thought about it. So one of the things that occurred to me and actually the participants brought this up was that they said, there's a generation gap. People who came during relocation, that tribes who were relocated from reservations from the 1940s to the 1970s, 
Um, I'm not sure, hope most people probably are aware, right, that Native Americans, right, the greatest concentration of population is not on reservations anymore. 70% of the population is in urban areas due to the relocation program. That that generation who started groups like Gay American Indians, who I mentioned earlier, they're getting older, right? They're in their 60s, 70s now, and that where the, the how are younger people taking up that, that, that piece? And so if, what they were saying to me was that this is not just about HIV, it's about healing. It's about um, how Native lives um, are valued. Do we tell people that they're sacred, right? that they matter? And part of that is also the cultural leadership, being involved within their Native community and taking up that leadership role so that you have that support network, but also the protective factors to deal with all the risk um, that Natives might face for HIV infection. So the recommendations that came up based on this were actually to do a three-site intervention at the Red Circle Project here in Los Angeles, uh, the Native American Health Centers in San Francisco and Oakland, and at the Seattle Indian Health Board. And the idea was what they were really telling me is that we needed this um, intergenerational cultural leadership model, right? Um, that how do older generations, right, can they pass down that information, that knowledge to these younger generations, not only to help prevent HIV, but to create leaders within two-spirit communities. Uh, and so the idea here is to match um, elders um, with youth, um, 25 uh, elders with 25 youth, uh, and then the, to do some training and focus group sessions to basically discuss cultural retention, right, for Native people, um, two-spirit leadership, and identify key issues related to intergenerational trauma. And we'd first do this with the elder participant group uh, and then we do it with the, the youth group as well and then bring the two, um, the two groups together basically to have some conversation, match them up with mentors um, and do some sort of needs assessment, right, initially to see what are their risk factors before the mentorship program and then we'd look at it again after um, six months and then 12 months to see um, if there's been sort of any changes. But one of the things we'd wanna do in a second year with this study, this intervention, would to have a cultural summit, summit and a ceremony of return and homecoming. Because one of the things that people told me because of all that trauma, that two-spirit cultural dissolution that I was talking to you about, many people have said we need to have ceremony. We need to actually uh, um, welcome two spirits back into the community. And it's interesting because this happened just about a month or so ago um, up in Oakland. A uh, medicine person from Pine Ridge, uh, Richard Moves Camp, uh, actually led uh, a, a ceremony uh, where the two-spirit people and uh, folks who don't identify as two-spirit in the Native community came together um, to basically be welcomed back um, into their rightful place um, uh, to be accepted, but also to, to say sorry, right? It was a, an opportunity to have that healing, to have that relationship. So one of the things that I found and, and talk about more extensively because this project is now turning into a book, but is that one of the key issues is vulnerability. I take, I, there's this concept I talk about called radical love. And I think it's something that's very key to, to, he, to dealing with this issue. And one of the aspects of radical love is um, allowing ourselves to be vulnerable and to tell our stories. But you, most folks are not gonna do that with people they don't feel comfortable with. That there can't be full healing until we actually tell our stories to say what has hurt us um, and what has impacted us. But often we don't wanna talk about those things because it brings those scars back up again often show people that, uh, you know, people talk about therapy, and uh, you've, maybe you've seen this before, right? You write the word therapist on a piece of paper, right? And you draw a line after the first E, right? And it tells you that it's, it's, it's an interesting irony, right? Because it says the rapist, if, if, if you look at that. And sometimes that's what people feel like when they go back in for that therapy session, is that that trauma is happening to them all over again because of the ways in which we approach or engage people because we have a lack of understanding and knowledge of that experience. What is the first thing people ask me when they uh, say, oh, you teach in Native American studies. What got you interested in that? You don't look Native American, right? Where's my long flowing hair and my beads and feathers, right? That those are stereotypes that exist, right? Um, that people don't know that Native people have red hair and blue eyes and white skin or uh, brown skin. Mostly people come to my class because we're American Indian studies. They say, oh, is this Native American studies or South Asian studies, right? They think they're in a class looking at South Asians. So there are all these stereotypes or that people, the first thing they say to Native people, right? And to me, when I tell them what I do for a living is um, they want to tell me their Indian story, right? Of how they went and 
went to some uh, event somewhere where they were they went to a powwow one time or they want to tell me about their Cherokee great great grandmother and how she was a princess right um, or how they got a Native American name from someone these are the kinds of things that we hear right or how do I get my DNA done so I can get that free government money that is what we become reduced to and so Karina Walters who was my mentor at University of Washington one of the things she talks about is these are forms of microaggressions, right? Daily experiences of racism that remind us that um, they're triggers, right? For more trauma, these reminders of the things that have happened to us. And so that's the idea of this mentorship, right? Is that we're in it together, we have that support and we can tell our stories, we can heal and we can laugh because um, laughter is really important in Indian communities. Um, but that we also can heal and that it's that it's okay to share. But that's the thing we also have to understand about native populations is that so many people, find Deloria, a Lakota scholar, said many years ago, um, what do Indians want? Leave us alone, right? And that that is, continues to remain to be true is that people have tried to intervene on our behalf. It happens in every segment of society, climate movement. Let's tell the Indians how to do um, what they need to do. Well, Winona LaDuke, the activist um, from the Ojibwe Anishinaabe Nation has said, we don't need you to tell us what to do with the environment, with the land. There was no famine, there was no drought, right? And we see it now in terms of leadership around movements um, and not just in native communities like the Black Lives Matter that I mentioned earlier. Who do you see come out in, in mass numbers? You see very few black people actually out there because those movements become usurped. The power is taken from our communities by outsiders. And for no other community is that true than native people. Part of it's due to size of population. Um, but also I think part of it is the lack of understanding of who native people are and what 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 it means to be from a sovereign nation or even the politics of not being recognized because of racial mixing or that so many tribes in California, so this would be an issue here too as well, although Southern California has more rec tribes that are recognized, but how many tribes in California are not recognized so get no funding? How do you go to get your funding if you're not enrolled and you have to go, or you are enrolled and you have to go back somewhere else is a factor too, right, for your health services if you have to go back to the reservation. There's just so many factors and complications and issues that folks don't understand. And so I think the main issue is that invisibility, right? But it's that, that, that support, um, someone to tell them, and this is what I tell my students. And I say, I'll say it to all of you, right? How many of you have ever had someone tell you that you're sacred, that your life matters, that what you do is ceremony? Do you think about your role and your position on this commission as a ceremony? Because ceremony is not just this sort of organized religious thing that we think about where we go and you know, have all these formalities. Ceremony is about reciprocity. It's about um, remembering the, the, the value and the importance of the work that we do and sharing that and seeing it as sacred and that um, it's changing lives. It's thanking Creator for, for um, the possibility to continue to do this work, like someone shared about the people who are still at risk, right? It's, it's, it's taking on that, 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 that space, not as a confrontation or conflict, um, but as an opportunity for healing. Uh, and um, so I think at, at, at this point, I'm going to um, stop and turn it back to the commission, but just really thank you all, and again, tell you that you're sacred, and I thank you for your work. <laughs>